I still remember writing that part of the story in which the time traveller returns to find his machine removed and his retreat cut off. Don't you people ever go to bed? I wrote on grimly to that accompaniment, and somehow, amidst the gathering disturbance of those days, the time machine got itself finished. troublesome lodger was one Herbert George Wells and it was at a boarding house in Sevenoaks in the summer of 1894 that Mr Wells invented time travel. Here was a contraption that would capture the imagination of millions, a machine that could travel both to the outer reaches of the remote past and to the far distant future. I think what H.G. Wells captured from blowing up the commuter towns of suburban Surrey in the War of the Worlds to an invisible man stalking the streets of sleepy Sussex was a very British blend of the exotic and the everyday, the familiar and the fantastic. H.G. Wells was a writer who would define his age. More than almost anyone else, Wells can claim to be the founding father of our modern imagination. And yet his own journey, from his birth in a humble crockery shop in Bromley 150 years ago, is perhaps the strangest and most fascinating story of all. The country round Bromley was being fast invaded by the spreading out of London, Eruptions of new roads and bricks and mortar covered lush meadows, but my father managed to see and make me see a hundred aspects of the old order of things. A wagtail, a tit's nest, a kingfisher, the pollen of pine trees drifting like a mist, the eagle in the bracken root, which I could tell him in return was Teres Aquilina. In 1884, England was under attack. But the invaders weren't Martians or Morlocks. They were the builders and developers of Victorian Britain, pushing the frontiers of London deeper into the sleepy rural southeast. And as his beloved Kentish countryside disappeared beneath the Victorian bulldozer, so the young Herbert George Wells took a monumental decision to leave his home and family behind for a new life in the capital. There he planned to study under one of the most brilliant men of the day, the biologist Thomas Huxley, better known to the Victorians as Darwin's bulldog. And in this, as in so much else, Wells was very much a man of his time. You see, this was an age of extraordinary scientific progress, and with Christianity apparently in headlong retreat, the Victorians had elevated a new god in its place. They worshipped at the altar of science. People had begun to worry about the future of Britain. Uh, in particular, they could see that Germany was becoming a, a big rival power. And one reason was that the German government was investing in stuff, investing in science, in technical education. And I think, therefore, it was a great time for, for Wells to come along because the government were looking for scientists. So when Wells got good marks for his science exams, he then got this letter from the government, this blue paper, saying, would you care to do a science degree? We'll, we'll fund you to do it, and you can come to... Um, the Normal School of Science, South Kensington, and your professor will be T.H. Huxley. Wells was very excited when he started his degree and he loved studying biology, but he hated studying geology. He thought it was really boring. So fortunately for us, he wasted a lot of his second year in the library reading English literature, instead reading Blake and Carlyle. So he didn't leave with his degree at first. He had to come back and do his degree later, and he had to work as a teacher in the meantime, but that was when Wells started working as a writer. By now, Wells seems set fair for a future of Victorian respectability. 
Engaged to his cousin Isabel, he threw himself into his new responsibilities. But although he had plenty of time for his keener students, he had rather less time for those who weren't. I think people who didn't want to learn, he had problems with those. I think as a school teacher, he used to sometimes back the kids about a bit, throw chalk at them. Um, if they weren't motivated, he really found that very difficult to give them motivation. But in 1887, Wells left London and his fiancée behind to take up a teaching post in North Wales. Which was a disaster. He got to playing rugby one day and he went down on the ground and his insides basically collapsed and he had terrible hemorrhages um, and almost died and it took a long time to come back from that. I had, I will admit, some beautiful moments of exquisite self-pity, <laughs> tender even to tears, but they were rare. In my bones, I disliked the idea of dying. I disliked it hotly and aggressively. I was exasperated not to have become famous, not to have seen the world. Still more deeply exasperated was I at the nets of restraint about me that threatened that I should die a virgin. <coughs> Confronted by his own mortality, Wells decided to live in the moment. There was not a second to lose. Now was the time to pursue his dream of life as a writer and to tie the knot with Isabel. They had a long courtship, and when they did get married, disillusionment set in pretty quickly. Isabel was conventional, unimaginative, and unresponsive in bed. Wells was driven by sexual desire, but I think it was very much entwined with writing for Wells. So for instance, he needed some kind of sexual outlet in order to be able to write. It was that the two were hand in hand. She also wasn't particularly supportive of Wells's ambition to write. She preferred the security of him having a career as a teacher. But teaching wasn't really for Wells. He saw himself as a writer, scraping by on articles, short stories and textbooks on a subject that was all the rage and one Wells knew a bit about, science. By the summer of 1894, Wells's life had become distinctly messy. Having separated from Isabel, he'd now shacked up with the young Jane Robbins, a former student of his. Mr and Mrs Wells? Yes. Do come in. And it was while he and Jane were staying in Sevenoaks, having left the city for the sake of his health, that Wells began working on the book that would eventually make his name. The story of Wells the writer is an object lesson in the virtues of persistence. He'd been dabbling in journalism for years, but he'd never really made his mark. So almost in desperation, he dug out a short story that he'd written years before for his college newspaper. Its title was The Chronic Argonauts, and it tells the story of a man with a remarkable invention, something, well, a bit like this. He'd heard discussions about fourth dimension as a student, you know, this idea that time is a dimension, and he could see this was a good story. No one had written a time travel story, to my knowledge, before. Um, so it was a very original idea, and he began writing this kind of gothic version uh, about this mad scientist who's being chased by a lynch mob of, of Welsh people who want to, to kill him. And I think really by the summer of 94, well, that was what he got left in his life. Um, he was having a very hard time of it. He was living in lodgings, um, not with his wife whom he'd left and divorced, but with one of his students he'd run away with, a very tense situation. He was also being harassed by the landlady about being unmarried to the woman he was with. He sat down and thought, how am I going to escape from this, from this world of harassment and no money? And he went into this amazing cosmic, mythic world of imagination. If the chronic Argonauts was going to provide the escape from obscurity that Wells so desperately craved, then it needed some work. Wells started rewriting from scratch, framing his improbable story within the familiar setting of London's clubland and ditching his hero's rather unusual name. In um, The Chronic Argonauts, he has a stupid name, uh, Moses Nabo Gipfel. Um, Wells, I think, quite rightly ditched that. The time traveller, for so it will be convenient to speak of him, was expounding a recondite matter to us. His grey eyes shone and twinkled, and his usually pale face was flushed and animated. You must follow me carefully. 
I shall have to controvert one or two ideas that are almost universally accepted. The geometry, for instance, they taught you at school, is founded on a misconception. For all Wells's big ideas, his book's unique appeal was captured in the three short words of its title, The Time Machine. Everybody remembers the section of the, the Eloi and the Morlocks, yeah, which is a sort of a cartoon of where evolution might take the British social class system. Why had the Morlocks taken my time machine? For I felt sure it was they who had taken it. Why too? If the Eloi were masters, could they not restore the machine to me? And why were they so terribly afraid of the dark. So you have literally useless infantile aristocrats living on the surface, having short, happy, beautiful lives, and then sort of brutal, thuggish, uh, proletarian Morlocks living underground uh, who come up and eat them from time to time. I think there's a, there's a certain relish there. It's, it's strange, in the book, the time traveller sort of sympathises with the Eloi because they, they're pitiable. But you get the sense that, that Wells is a Morlock man, is, is that he sort of feels that there's a, a, a justice that's being um, carried on here. You know, I think The Time Machine is a much darker and more political book than we often remember. In the Eloi and the Morlocks, the two human subspecies who survive into the far future, Wells created a blistering parody of the haves and have-nots of industrial Britain. And even as his fellow Victorians were glorying in the gospel of progress, Wells imagined a future in which all that has been torn down, in which progress has led only to disaster and nature has returned to wreak its revenge. And in an age when we are grappling to come to terms with the environmental costs of scientific progress, you could hardly want for a more disturbing warning. I suppose I'd probably agree that actually um, it's worth remembering that there are other times that the time traveller visits in the time machine. So after he's gone to um, 802.701, he then goes um, sort of much further into the future. Uh, and, and sees how the planet is starting to change geologically and meteorologically. Um, and then right at the end of the novel, which for me I think is perhaps the most interesting section, is he travels, I think, or he thinks about 30 million years into the future, um, and there's a kind of new ice age emerging, and um, there's just this algal slime, and the, uh, the um, atmosphere is, is really toxic, he finds it very difficult to breathe. Um, and he realises that the Earth has kind of shifted into this um, new kind of time of entropy and, and a, a kind of, a die, you know, the dying of all organic matter. But would the Victorians really want to read about a terrifying future in which progress has torn their world apart? Well, they did. For when the time machine came out a year later, it was a smashing success. My dear mother, my last book seems a hit. Everyone has heard of it, and all kinds of people seem disposed to make much of me. I'm invited out tonight and every night next week, except Monday and Friday. I've had letters, too, from four publishing firms asking for the offer of my next book. It's rather pleasant to find oneself something in the world after all the years of trying and disappointment. Your ever affectionate son, Bertie. The Time Machine was the first example of what Wells called the scientific romance. And you know, that label basically captures its appeal. You see, what Wells had created was an irresistible formula, a blend of serious social and scientific commentary with pure page-turning entertainment. Mm. But although Wells was now a very successful man, he was not a healthy one. With all its pollution, booming Victorian London was simply too much for him. So now, married to Jane, he made a break for freedom. Once again, he headed for suburbia, moving this time not to Seven Oaks, but to Surrey. We're interrupting this programme to bring you breaking news of an alien invasion in Woking in Surrey. 
reports are coming in of a mass evacuation. You can see there big explosions. We're getting some very alarming pictures in just now. And we're hearing that drones are being used to combat the tripod type creatures. And this just in, the Prime Minister has declared a state of emergency. So begins the invasion, at least according to Wells's most famous novel, The War of the Worlds. It's a story of men versus Martians. But Wells's inspiration came from a historical event rather closer to home. One day he's walking with his brother Frank and they're discussing the Tasmanians, a very notorious imperial outrage at the time. Uh, it seems that the Tasmanians were actually driven to extinction by unscrupulous colonists. You know, Wells was, a, was, a, was a, among those with a very healthy conscience about imperialism. And Frank said, um, how would we feel if somebody dropped out of the sky and treated us the way we treated the, the Tasmanians? In that moment, for H.G. Wells to turn that idea on its head and suggest that there could be a race which is tech far technologically superior to ours, and that race could be Martians coming from outer space, um, is, a, is a really interesting kind of conceit. Where does the invasion begin? Not in London or New York, but right here, in Woke. The War of the Worlds turns Victorian Britain's power and prestige on their head. But what makes it still so powerful today is the fact that it's set so firmly in the everyday world of suburban southern England. In fact, you could hardly find a better example of Wells' supreme skill as a populist. You see, The War of the Worlds is a book about empire and colonisation, about nature and biology and that Darwinian struggle at the heart of life itself. But what Wells does is he packages all that in this thrilling adventure story set in the sleepy commuter towns where the author and his readers lived. This thing I saw, a monstrous tripod higher than many houses striding over the young pine trees and smashing them aside in its career, a walking engine of glittering metal. It's such a fantastic text. When I teach it to my students, it's so clear, just his use of language, the way in which he uses kind of um, metaphors and, and similes to try and describe what a completely other alien culture would look like. The reason that War of, War of the Worlds is still with us is actually the reason that some of Wells' other stories are. Dr Moreau, The Invisible Man, first man in the moon, time machine, it's because he got there first. The stuff that now just seems obvious, the stuff that seems like cliches, you know, the first contact scene, the first shot of the Martians, the first shot fired, the devastation of the cities, the rallying, the weird survivalist cults, the grow, all this kind of stuff. You can't say they're cliches because he invented them. Be a man, said I. He was scared out of his wits. What good is religion if it collapses under calamity? Think of what earthquakes and floods, wars and volcanoes have done before to men. Did you think God had exempted us? He's not an insurance agent. Wells was now the rising star of English fiction. He was also an increasingly rich man. To cap it all, even his health had started to get better. He and his wife Jane were now planning to start a family. And so he poured his winnings into a brand new custom-built house on the Kentish coast, then something of a magnet for successful writers. His books were now taking him away from the scientific romance towards straight social realism. But then, one day at the beach, he saw something extraordinary. Upon the beach one day, the sea lady appeared in a close-fitting bathing dress and with the sunlight in her hair, she took possession of my writing desk. The sea lady is nowhere near as well known as the time machine or the war of the worlds, but what it offers is a very revealing insight into Wells' psyche. You see, it captures many of his classic themes, the the thrill of sex, the dread of death, the dream of escape, the power of the imagination. But what it captures above all 
is his growing sense of claustrophobia. His fear of being trapped, of being tied down by family life, and what he himself called his craving for some lovelier experience than life has yet given me. And I think this was a very pivotal moment for Wells. It sort of lit his sexual imagination, and he remembered it his whole life. The result was a novel called The Sea Lady. Now, The Sea Lady is about a mermaid who comes ashore and seduces a liberal politician called Chatteris. And Chatteris has to make the choice between, on the one hand, his career and his relationship with a respectable woman, and on the other hand, his yearnings for passion and for imaginative fulfillment. I definitely think there's a correlation between Wells's affairs and his writing. I think at its most basic, being in love produced a rush of euphoria, which in turn generated creative energy and usually a novel or novels resulted from the affairs. Nothing ever happened between Wells and the girl on the beach. He was still in love with his wife, Jane, but she was a remarkably tolerant woman. And in the years ahead, she allowed him to conduct a string of affairs, all in the name of literary creativity. He actually ran through a, a draft of The Sea Lady with her. Of course, she probably didn't realise quite what Wells was intending when he wrote that. And of the end, I can only guess and dream. Did there come a sudden horror upon him at the last? A sudden perception of infinite error? And was he drawn down swiftly and terribly, a bubbling repentance into those unknown deeps? Or was she tender and wonderful to the last? And did she wrap her arms about him and draw him down, down until the soft waters closed above him, down into a gentle ecstasy of death? The scientific romances had established Wells' reputation as a great populist but now he wanted to be taken seriously. He channeled his literary writing into books that he thought would be taken more seriously. I think maybe Tono Bungay and the New Machiavelli are, are his best novels in, the, in the, a literary sense. And I suppose it's like if you look at just pictures of him throughout his life, he got kind of bloated and puffy, and so did his prose. You may think me superstitious, if you will, and foolish, but indeed I am more than half convinced that he had in truth an abnormal gift and a sense, something I know not what, that in the guise of wall and door offered him an outlet, a secret and peculiar passage of escape into another and altogether more beautiful world. In many ways, of course, Wells had already made his great escape. The days of poverty and obscurity were now far behind him. Over the next half century, he remained one of the most famous men in the world. Not just a science fiction pioneer, but a socialist radical, a dystopian prophet, a feminist champion, an all-round literary celebrity. And yet, for all his fame and for all his money, there always remained, I think, something restless about him, something dissatisfied not just with the 20th century, but perhaps also with himself. I just wonder whether from time to time he too caught a glimpse of that door in the wall, a glimpse of another world, and perhaps also another Wells, that might have been. Comparing himself against Henry James and Ford Maddox Ford and thinking, you know, why are they being treated so much more seriously? I tell you what, I bet Henry James and Ford Maddox Ford sat around saying, why aren't our books selling as well as War of the Worlds? As the Victorian age gave way to the 20th century, the wheels of progress turned ever faster. And Wells soon found himself in a world where science fiction was becoming scientific fact. He wanted his writing to be useful, to do something. He doesn't want 
a novel to be like a great painting or to be like a great cathedral. He wants art to be like a marketplace or a road. It can be beautiful, but it can also do something. It can be useful as well. By the end of his life, Wells's warnings about the abuse of science had come true. He had foreseen the horrors of aerial warfare and the atomic bomb. Atrocities carried out not by Morlocks or by Martians, but by modern man. H.G. Wells died on the 13th of August, 1946. He left a world that he'd always feared, a ravaged dystopia brought to its knees by the effects of war. But in his final years, Wells also left a slim volume called The Rights of Man that would become the inspiration for one of modern history's most important documents, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And when the uh, architects of the, of the Rights of Humanity Declaration uh, came to do their work, they relied heavily on well, Wells's text. So if, if nothing else, even if all his literature uh, uh, and, and, and the details of his life vanished tomorrow, just that one achievement, I think, will, uh, will, will live forever. More than any other writer of his generation, the boy from Bromley left an indelible mark on the modern age. I think in his bones, Wells was always a son of Southern England, a man shaped by the small towns and suburbs of the home counties. And yet his ideas had a genuinely global impact. And whether you're in Bromley or in Woking, in Seven Oaks or in Folkestone, if you dream of another world, then it's the words of H.G. Wells. It's the power of the story that will sweep you through time and space to the very furthest reaches of the imagination. I think Rolf did so many amazing things, but at the end of the day, I, I would go along with the, the Argentinian author, Jorge Luis Borges, when he said that ultimately the early science fiction stories will become part of human mythology. You know, when the English language is dead, when our ear is forgotten about, and there's probably some guys living in domes in the Arctic Circle somewhere, they're all playing the story of the time machine and the space invasion. You know, they, these are stories that when the invisible man, these will go on forever. You know, they're, they're, they're bigger than the English language. He was a man ahead of his time. By several decades, he was sort of forging the staples of what we came to consider to be, um, you know, the signifiers of science fiction as a, as a literary genre. You remember him from the scientific romances. All the other stuff is kind of interesting, but it's a support to the books. And at the heart of Wells's stories, is a message that will never grow old. That however advanced our technology, however spectacular our achievements, we must always remember one thing. We are only human. There's a star man waiting in the sky He'd like to come and meet us But he thinks